So let's move on to the second uh, paper of the session. So uh, Rainer Schlusser from uh, University of uh, Rostock on the use of textual data. So Rainer, you have about uh, 25 minutes. Okay. Thank you for having me here and our paper on the program in this great conference. So this is joint work with Philip Adema and Jan Prüser. It's about the impact of adding textual predictors for macroeconomic uh, pay risk. So given the audience, I can be brief on the motivation about quantile forecasts. Of course, quantile forecasts have the, uh, have the advantage of allowing for a quantile specific predictive relationship between the target variable and the covariates. And usually as economists, we are more interested in, more in the extreme economic periods in the downside uh, risk. And literature has moved in this direction from uh, point forecasting to quantile forecasting. And another recent development in macro forecasting is the use of textual data. Textual data have the advantage of being timely available and some papers have already shown that they might embed incremental information um, in addition to hard economic predictors. But most of those studies use them in settings that only look at point forecasts. We look here the potentially added value of textual data for quantile forecasts. What we do in this paper um, it's on the applied side. We explore the role of textual predictors for quantile now and one step ahead forecasts for monthly data. We look at linear and nonlinear models. Linear models, we look at quantile, based on quantile regressions with different shrinkage priors. And our nonlinear methods are Gaussian process regressions and quantile regression forests. And as target variables, we look at employment, uh, inflation, total CPI, production, and consumer sentiment. Let me start with the models that feature a linear predictive relationship. So the Bayesian quantile regression can be stated in this form, where the um, error terms um, have a mixture representation, and we can um, state our shrinkage priors in a canonic uh, general form. So we have, in this setup, we have the possibility to include global local shrinkage priors. So this term psi is for the um, predictor-specific um, shrinkage, in shrinkage intensities. And we have here the global shrinkage intensity. And so we consider three specifications. The first one is the rich prior. And as you can see, here we only have a global shrinkage part, no local shrinkage part, we, because the sizes are all set to one. So this prior doesn't allow for very rich shrinkage patterns. It's a, um, only the, the global shrinkage term. So it would be consistent with a dense representation of the uh, prediction problem where we have many weak predictors. In contrast, we have the horseshoe prior which um, doesn't require the user to, to uh, elicit any uh, hyperparameters. We have the half Cauchy distributions for both um, terms. And this would be consistent with a sparse representation of the prediction problem, meaning that we get rid of most of the predictors because the, the horseshoe prior has fat tails and spikes at zero. It means we get rid of most predictors and leaving only a few strong ones. And the lasso prior is the most flexible one, which can uh, be between a sparse and a dense representation. So allows for the most, uh, for the richest shrinking patterns. Gaussian process regression. Yesterday in Massimiliano Marcellino's talk, he already gave a motivation um, for this kind of, for this model class. We do it in a quite standard fashion. 
with a squared exponential kernel. So the tuning parameters w1, w2 control the, the smoothness of the function. And so nonlinear method and for the our second nonlinear method is are the quantile regression forests. Here we have a non-parametric frequentist method. And what it's different from standard random forests is that for standard random forests, we try to um, approximate the conditional mean. And here we try to approximate the conditional distribution. So when you drop down one predictor x, which might be high dimensional, for standard random forest, you would only store the conditional mean in each tree. Here, you have to store all the values because you want to, all the observations because you want to approximate the conditional distribution. But uh, it, it's an extension by Mainzhausen from the um, standard random forest to the quantile random forest. But the intuition is the same. You want to grow a large collection of trees. Um, and then using only a subset of all the predictors at each node to decorrelate the trees. So you to, to ensure that you have heterogeneous trees and thereby reduce the variance and improve on the um, bias variance trade-off. So the macro predictors um, we get from the um, FRED MD um, data set, but let me introduce how we obtain our textual predictors. We obtain them as news attention measures from a large collection of newspaper articles. So let me briefly give you an intuition what topic models do. So topic models um, try to capture the stochastic process which most likely has generated the text. So the, each document, we, as documents, we use roughly 800,000 newspaper articles from New York Times and Washington Post. So this is our so-called corpus, the collection of documents. And the idea is that each document, you have different documents here, and each document is a mixture of latent topics, which are outside, which are outside the specific documents. And each topic is a probability distribution over words, over a set of vo vocabulary. So each word is part of each topic, but with different probabilities. The first topic is about genetic um, articles. We have uh, prominent words like gene, DNA, genetic. And of course, as a user, you have to label it. So it's not, of course, labeled by the, by the machine. So the, all documents share the same um, topics, but with different probabilities. So given that we have the topic proportions here for a given document, of course, this is the job of the topic model to estimate those quantities. We have to estimate the distribution, the uh, probability distribution of the words in, within each topic. And we have to estimate the topic proportions for each document. Of course, we don't observe only the, uh, we don't observe these quantities, we only observe the words. And then it's the job of here we use the correlated topic model to estimate the probability distribution, the words of the topic proportion for each document. And what we work with, which what are our predictors, are those guys here, the topic proportions. So it's about the attention of a given topic at a given point in time. So if, for example, we have a topic where words um, about inflation, prices, have a high probability and the document has a high topic proportion for the, say, inflation topic, then media coverage at a certain point in time is high for inflation. So we use this as a um, news attention measure. And the advantage of the correlated topic model 
uh, in contrast to the more standard latent Dirichlet allocation model, which is more famous, uh, is that we can capture that some topics tend to occur together within one document. So if the document is about inflation, it might be highly probable that you will that there appear also words like commodity prices, but not likely that it's a topic like. So the topic proportions are only about the content of the articles, not about sentiment. So there are different directions in text analysis you could go. You could, of course, do both, extract measures of sentiment and of content. Here we focus on the content. But of course, it's possible to do some tone adjustment to add sentiment predictors as well. So um, when um, extracting the vocabulary for the, for the topics, we only use the documents until our evaluation period starting in 1999 in October. So the, the, the first documents are available in 1980. But to set up the topics, we only use uh, the vocabulary until 1999 to avoid any look ahead bias. And then in a given month, we estimate the out of sample topic proportions and simply take the average over all documents in a given month. So here, are examples uh, from our 80 topics. Um, as a user, you have to specify the number of topics. We go with 80, but have, of course, a robustness checks with 100 and other numbers. So, but it's not very sensitive. So, and from our 80 extracted topics, uh, for example, this one, we could label topic 71, we could label it inflation because the most prominent words are prices, commodities, and so on. Of course, we could, in the appendix of the paper, we have the most probable words in each uh, topic. And it, it looks like what you would expect. So inflation, the media coverage goes up here in, um, at the end of the sample, or the housing topic during the... Uh, Great financial crisis, or here you have the Gulf War and uh, different debt crisis, Mexico, Euro, and so on. So those are examples of our news attention measures, which we use as predictors. So let me briefly give you the forecasting setup. So we have three different sets of predictors, the FRED and D data only. We use vintage data. Um, so to avoid um, the bias. And we have one setting where we use textual predictors only, and then a combined set where we use both of them. And we include in each setting 12 legs of the respective target variable. And so for now casts in the given month T, say we are at the end of December, we can use the macro predictors from November released in December, and the textual data from December, and the financial um, predictors in the Fred MD data set, like exchange rates, which are also uh, from December. And similarly, for one step ahead prediction, they were at the end of December, one to forecast January, we use the macro data from November released in December, and textual data from December, as well as financial predictors from December, so we have the advantage from textual data that they are more timely available. So we start in 1980, where the first news articles are available, and then we go with recursive estimations on an expanding window, starting with the evaluation period in 1999 in October, and we use the standard measure for evaluating our predictions using the quantile score at different levels, of course, in the tails, which might be more interesting, but in the center as well. So here are the outputs for the nowcasts, and then the next slide for the one step ahead forecast. Everything is measured relative to a AR1 benchmark. Doesn't matter too much if it's AR1 or AR2 or 4. Um, what you see is in the columns, we have the different models from the different shrinkage priors, Horseshoe, Lasso Ridge, and the two nonlinear models, Gauss and Processes, Quantile Random Forests, and in the um, Rows, we have the different target variables, 
employment, inflation, production, and sentiment. And so the benchmark is the quantile score at one. So if we observe a quantile score below one, meaning we do better than the AR1 benchmark. And we have three different predictor sets. The, the yellow one is the thread only data set. Uh, in green, we have text only, and blue is the combined data set. And if you see um, dot, which is colored inside, that means it's uh, significantly better in terms of the debold Mayano test at the 10% level for one sided test. So, what are the main takeaways? Um, first of all, it seems that um, textual data improve the predictions in the tails. For example, look at sentiment, the combined predictor set, textual data, the, and uh, thread and D data, the blue line does better in the tails than only the, the thread and D data. It's not always the case, but on average, across the different target variables, and the methods we observe that, especially in the left tail, um, text data adds some value, consistent with the um, notion that during say, COVID or the uh, financial crisis, um, they are timely available and they add additional value to hard predictors. What we also observe is that they might be more important in the linear models. Um, they tend to be competitive once we add textual data, for example, here, inflation, um, well, when we go with rich, so imp large improvement for, um, when we add textual data in the left tail. We observe, in general, better performance for the nonlinear models, for the Gaussian process and the uh, quantile random forest, especially for Gaussian processes, which seems to be the, the most powerful method here. So nonlinearities uh, turn out to be important. And our interpretation is why textual data add more in the linear models, especially rich, is that um, perhaps they are compensation for the lack of complexity in linear models. So um, given that there's complexity missing in the linear models, they add more than in the li nonlinear models. So we have these different shapes, this hump-shaped um, form for, for the nonlinear models and more the U-shaped forms of quantile scores for the linear models. So again, especially the, uh, the nonlinear models do very well in the tails on average. We observe large gains from textual data, especially for predicting con consumer sentiment, which is consistent with the previous findings in the literature that news data are important for forming expectations for um, households. And on average, we can say not in every case textual data add something, but even if they uh, don't um, lead to more accurate forecasts, they don't hurt. So, and similar for the one step ahead forecasts, but it's more difficult to achieve lower quantile scores, um, but on average, we see the same patterns. It's the summary of the results, especially we have the, the, um, the gains in the tails and for the linear forecasting models. Interestingly, the rich, um, the rich shrinkage prior does better on average in the now cast and the one step ahead forecast, even though it's the most simple, um, um, the, the most simple of the three shrinkage priors, only allowing for global uh, shrinkage. And this is consistent with a dense representation of macro predictive tasks. So many variables are weakly important. So we don't have st very strong predictors, but many of them are in some sort of relevant, but not that much. So and um, we try to shed some light on which variables are important and to give have a some sense about the variable importance across heterogeneous and nonlinear models. We did the following. We approximated our quantile predictions uh, with a lasso type regression, which has been suggested in the literature. So you see the standard lasso uh, regression. Here's our quantile forecast. And here, 
are the predictors and so which variables explain our predictions. And what we find here is we did it for the 10% quantile because left tail might be more interesting than the center of the distribution. And what you can see here, the bars tell you the share of non-zero coefficients, the survivors of the, of the lasso. And what we see is in the red bars correspond to the thread data and the green bars to the textual data. It's quite balanced. We don't have, um, on average, uh, a clear, um, say a clear um, overweight of, of uh, one or the other. What we can see is, again, for sentiment, uh, the textual data turn out to be quite important, which was consistent with the uh, previous slide that adding textual data was uh, especially important here for sentiment. And once again, we observe or we have um, evidence of a dense representation of the, um, of the prediction problem because we see many non-zero coefficients and if we um, slightly, um, if we play around with the tuning parameter alpha, then it can happen that, for example, here for the quantile random forest, for the now cast to the, to the one step ahead forecast that none of them, or none of the predictors are relevant even um, at all. So meaning that it's evidence for a weak, or say a dense representation with many weak predictors. So, so the key takeaways, I don't reiterate them, but maybe um, say what could our, be our future directions um, for this work. So obviously on the data side, we could extend the analysis with sentiment scores. Uh, I think it would be also interesting to add a service of professional forecast data and on the methodological side, I was inspired yesterday by Julia Montuan's presentation about um, using quantized scores for density combination or model combination density forecasts. So I think in my view, those are the most interesting avenues for future research, but I'm curious to hear yours and Jasper's and thank you. Now we have a discussion by uh, Jasper de Winter. Jasper from the Dutch Central Bank. So first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the, for the invitation to discuss this uh, really interesting paper by Reiner and co-authors. Um, so basically, the main idea of the paper is to explore the benefits of textual predictors from monthly tail risk forecasts. And they use, um, and they do this for four variables. So employment, industrial production, inflation, and consumer sentiment. And they use a correlated topic model, as Reine explained, on a large news database of English news articles. Um, and they analyze linear and nonlinear models. So that gives you a nice, as you can nicely see, as he shows, that you can see the difference between the linear models and the nonlinear models. And I think uh, one of the contributions is that he uses textual indicators, but not only to forecast the mean. So in most of these models, uh, they're not modeling the quantiles. So that's something new. And I think there are two main insights. There are a lot of insights in the paper, but the two main takeaways for me are is that nonlinear models have a higher now in forecasting accuracy in the tails of the distribution than linear models. And that these news topics are especially beneficial for forecasting the tails of the forecast. So they're not so much informative for improving the forecast of the, of the median, but more for the left tail. So I have some comments on the, on the paper, but I picked out four that I think are, uh, are, are interesting. And because um, it's, I think it's fair to say it's a rather empirical paper or it's an applied paper. So my, most of my comments will be on the setup of the, um, of the empirical part of the paper, but they also have a technical comment. All right. So my first comment is about the re robustness um, of your exercise to shifts in the timing of the real-time exercise. So what do I mean? So, I saw you use the FRED MD database, and I wasn't sure what the exact timing of the database was. So I emailed the, the, the maker of this database, Michael McCracken from the, from the FED. And he said, well, 
we download all the data on the last business day of the month. That's, that's the timing of the database. Then you use 100 monthly indicators, so 21 financial and 80 news topics. Um, and you impose that um, macroeconomic indicators have a one month publication date uh, delay and the financial indicators and the news indicators have no publication delay. But you have to re remember that the outcomes of your analysis are then only valid on the last day of the month, right? Because if you shift the exercise by a week or two weeks, then the outcomes might change. Why? Because um, as uh, Marta Bamburu is not here today and also Gerard showed in a, in a paper already from 2011, I think, is that it, it, it depends a lot on the time, on, on the exact day in the month that you do this forecast. Um, and a recent paper by Knotek and Zaman in 2002 shows this for inflation forecasting, so he shifts it. Um, so, for instance, in the US, you have, like, um, I think the unemployment figures are released seven days after the end of the month. Industrial production, two weeks after the end of the month. So you can imagine that the incremental power of these news topics might decrease, right? If you, if you add this, if you shift the analysis by two weeks, then it will be a different picture. So what I did is just basically do that. So I, I, took, the, I took the database, all the indicators you have in the, that you use from the FRED MD database, uh, looked up the exact publication calendar for, uh, for the indicators between April and mid-May and see what happened to the publication delays. So in your database, in April, you have 21 financial indicators with the same publication delay. Well, if you shift by two weeks, then the number of macroeconomic indicators in your database will increase by 54. So that means roughly that seven, in, the, in your paper, you have 21% of the indicators, the hard indicators known. If you shift by two weeks, that will increase to 75%. And it's very likely if these indicators have a high correlation with, um, with the future forecast, that this will decrease the forecasting power of the textual predictions, okay? And this brings me to my second comment, if the presentation works with me, yep. And that's um, about the indicators you include. So in FRED MD, there's only one survey indicator. Um, while we know from previous research that survey indicators are very good indicators. Why? Because they're available timely, just as your news indicators. So this is a fierce competitor to the news topics. But it's not included in the analysis. There's only, so if, for instance, if you forecast inflation, you only have the Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. So my advice would be to increase it. And it's very easy. Um, because these indicators are all available. And the only thing is they're not in FRED MD, but these survey indicators are not, they're, they're not revised. So, so you, it's basically, you can include them. And then some indicators are even available before the end of the month. So again, this will probably decrease um, the value added of these, um, of these textual indicators, which is something that is, that is found also in other research. So these are two comments on the on the, on the sort of the data part and how you should interpret results and my advice to include also consumer indicators. And the last empirical comment that I would like to highlight is, yeah, it was discussed, uh, discussed lengthy also yesterday, but the, the impact of outliers in your data set. So what I show here are your four indicators that you have. So that's industrial production, inflation, employment, and consumer sentiment. And I plotted the bands. So these are kind of uh, three standard deviations of this indicator over the period 1980, 2008, August. So just before the financial crisis. And then you see that in the estimation of your model, this will probably play some role, right? So you do an expanding window. So up until 2008, there's not, there's not much of a problem. Then you get the financial crisis. This might disturb your coefficients in the model somewhat. Um, but actually, only COVID might be really problematic, but it's at the end of your, of your sample. And then again, your quantile regression somehow ensures you against these outliers, okay? Because it's not, you, you, you don't do a regression to the mean, you use quantile uh, re regression, so it's some, somewhat insured against. But what might be your problem is that in the way you show your results is um, you calculate a quantile score over the entire period. Um, so my suggestion would be to show the quantile score in a like a cumulative sense. It was shown yesterday also. So do a rolling quantile score, so you can see where the indicate where the um, where it adds the most in the um, uh, so, so where your news indicators add most value. 
And usually from previous research, we see that the relative uh, forecasting performance improves around crisis. So then you really need these monthly indicators. In tranquil times, it's, it's very hard to beat an AR model, but during crisis, it's, it's, it really helps. So that would be a suggestion to use that. Then I have, I think, two more minutes for the uh, comment on the model. Okay, so what you have in your model is you basically um, fix the topic um, or the, the, the words that are in the topics over the period 88, 99. So that's, um, I, I think that's, that's a problem when you do uh, recursive estimation and you want to see what happens in time because a word like Brexit is basically not inside your topic model. Is that important? Well, um, uh, we did some research for the, for the Netherlands and, we, and there we changed the topic model. So we sort of made dynamics into this word topic distribution. Then you can see what happens. So from 2000 until 2013, this is a relevant measure of the importance of this word. I don't want to go into the details. But then there was a speech of Cameron in 2013, June, where he, so he, he announced that there will be a, a, a referendum on, on Brexit. And then right after you see, if you have a dynamic word topic distribution, you see, of course, you see the importance of this word increase then. And then later on, when the referendum was announced, it was increased again. And in your context, this can be um, this can be problematic because the topic the the topic proportions that you have in your model will probably change. So if you don't include Brexit, that that word, then it, it doesn't allow you for an increase in a, in, in in the topic. So just to make this more clear, so here I show you uh, how how this um, how the uh, word topic distribution changed for the topic financial markets in our model. So in, on the left side is the first time slide, and on the right side is the, is the last time slide. And there you can see, for instance, the word ECB, of course, it wasn't existent. Uh, it, it wasn't existing before 99, right? So this, th this first slide didn't take that period into account, and the last slide does, the last slide does, and then you see an enormous increase in this word. So it would also, in your case, it would also increase the topic proportion of the topic fi financial market. So I think that would be interesting to see if you can do something like that. So overall, I think it's a very nice paper uh, and it combines state-of-the-art Bayesian techniques and topic modeling. And I think it really stimulates further uh, discussion on tail risk now and forecasting using textual data. So thanks a lot. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. Abru. So. My comment is that I'm curious why you didn't include uh, the Wall Street Journal. You're including two uh, journals that are typically considered on the left uh, in, in the US. So I'm wondering if that's introducing some bias. And um, I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Uh, I'm Wajay Mazur from National Bank of Poland. I have a question as a follow-up of excellent discussion. Uh, perhaps those topics shouldn't be treated as independent variables, but as things that move parameters of thread data, right? So I'm saying you could use some kind of nonlinear combinations, perhaps, right, uh, in a way. Because it, it seems to me that uh, looking at this Brexit example, right, it looks like structural change in a relationship, not as a single bump. Right, uh, so so perhaps you could look at this this way, and I would be interested in um, a longer horizons. Right, how it works. Thank you. Just a very follow up comment. Um, I think that sentiment measures maybe extracted from these newspapers might help quite a bit in terms of uh, prediction. And we have seen it in a variety of ways that uh, uh, send measures more credit to uncertainty, risk, uh, and maybe more focused also on economic outcomes. So related to Pablo's point, I don't know if you use all articles in these journals, but you might add uh, a lot of noise. So I don't know if you can subset on articles that discuss economic conditions or that are more related to the, the topic you're trying to, sorry, the variables you're trying to predict. Hi, thank you. This is Elena Bobeka from the ECB. 
I was uh, wondering whether um, when you try to, to forecast, for instance, uh, inflation, you used uh, all the variables that you got from the textual analysis based on all the topics, or just several, or and if you used all of them, actually, uh, which ones you found maybe more important for inflation, let's say? Uh, it would also be interesting when, but is it maybe the real uh, side uh, related variables or maybe the nominal ones related to inflation particularly? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So maybe right now, if you want to rapidly answer the questions. Thank you for the comments and the suggestions. Um, all of them are valid points and some of them are particularly interesting like including the survey indicators and doing the dynamic word topic model so i have a more dynamic treatment um yes concerning the why we didn't include further articles from other newspapers it's um those were part of the lexis nexus database so we could have a look whether we could perhaps include more newspapers um for example, for uh, inflation, which topics uh, turned out to be important? They were more on the nominal side. Um, sentiment is something we can include, uh, which would uh, several ways to do it, to add sentiment scores. I think also the, the interactions um, of hard economic data and, and the textual predictor is something we might have a deeper look into. And so I have to think about the first uh, of your first comment with the um, with the last business day and the delay. So I could be more precise about that. Um, so if we address those points, some of them will decrease probably the value of, of um, textual indicators. Like if we include survey data, I'm quite sure that the value will be decreased. Um, but let's see whether we still have some gains on, at least on the left tail. But on the other hand, if we have more uh, dynamic models, perhaps we can have some gains on the other side. So perhaps we miss something with our, um, because we have words like Brexit not in there. So let's see what happens if we include those changes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for this presentation.